Welcome to Strength for the Journey. Thanks for joining us again. Strength for the Journey is a radio program designed to strengthen the believer for the days that lie ahead. We have a website at strength with the number four, thejourney.com. And this is radio program number 95 if you're listening by shortwave radio or by radio. Tonight I have a uh, very good friend that recently moved to Panama. His name is Daryl Ish. Aish, I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, he's with us tonight. Thanks, Daryl, for joining us. Sure. It's my pleasure, Andrew. Thanks sure for inviting me. That's, that last name pronunciation is probably the one that's been around for a yeah. long time. <laughs> yeah. It's Daryl Aish. <laughs> very rarely has anybody pronounced it correctly, so you're in good company. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for coming on the program tonight, and uh, it's going to be a very interesting program. You have a, a long history of ministry and working with various ministries and working with Spanish-speaking people. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, uh, so I'm really going to be fun to hear your story that has evolved for how many years since you've given your heart to the Lord and you're pro- probably... Oh, since I was five years old. <laughs> yeah, it's been a long time. I won't tell you how old I am now. <laughs> but well, yeah, you- with a name like Ace, you know, nobody's going to think that I speak Spanish. So they're probably <laughs> going, how is it that you work with Spanish speakers? Well, I know that the story that you have is is very interesting, how even how Panama ended up on your radar through probably some divinely coordinated events in your life. But I'd like for you just to kind of go backwards in history a little bit and see, you know, what, how did this all evolve in ministry and, and uh, you got involved with uh, Focus on the Family. Mm-hmm. And uh, tell yeah. us a little bit about your experience and how well, that all if happened. Well, if I could go just a little further than that, uh, because of the Spanish component, um, I was actually born and raised in Venezuela, South America, um, and that is, is why I do speak Spanish. Um, I'm fluently bilingual. I wish I were trilingual. One of these days I'll pick up Italian or Fran- uh, French. Uh, those are the two languages I'd love to speak. Uh, but, um, yeah, I, I often tell people that I'm a Latino trapped in a gringo body. So you see me and you see, you see gringo, but in the heart, I'm, I'm very much Latino. I, I grew up, uh, like I say, in South America until I was 18 years old. Um, so my experiences have really been formed by being in the Latin culture, not being in the American culture. So it's interesting that... Uh the formidable years, it's interesting that, that like you said, is, is different than having those cement, wet cement years that kind of solidify a lot of our mm-hmm. personality and stuff was in yes. South America. Absolutely. And, and, and like any missionary kid uh, will attest to, uh, it, uh, there are certainly struggles that go on with that uh, because of the fact that you feel sometimes like a fish out of water. You feel like you belong to this culture, but you don't look like the culture. And so people think of you as something different, even though you aren't. So it's it's a very weird dichotomy. And then you come back to the U.S., um, say, on a, on a furlough or a home assignment, and you look like the culture, and everybody thinks you are, but you aren't. And uh, and so it, it, it is odd. You're it is odd. breed altogether. <laughs> and, of course, back when I was a child, uh, we didn't have the Internet. Uh, we didn't have cell phones. Um, we didn't have a lot of the things that we have today that keep people in communication throughout the entire world. And so we would often go years uh, without hearing from loved ones. Uh, we didn't even have a phone in our home for five years, I remember. Uh, so we'd have to go to the neighbor's house and call occasionally. Um, and so... You know, just the contact with the U.S. wasn't there, and when we would come back, there was definitely culture shock because of that. People dressed differently, people used different words, um, and so you'd have to adjust. But I know the show's not about that. So. <laughs> well, tell us a little bit about how you got involved with, you know, your experience speaking Spanish. Obviously, was a big plus for you to land the job that you did with Focus on the Family. Yeah. Uh, tell us what you did with Focus on the Family. Yeah, um, I was actually working at a local radio station in Long Beach um, after graduating uh, with a broadcasting degree. Um, And uh, a friend of mine told me that they were looking for an editor at Focus and an editor for the English broadcast uh, for Focus on the Family. Uh, Well, I had done editing and I was looking for, you know, something to move up in my career. And so um, I applied and I got that job. But I only worked uh, directly with Dr. Dobson editing those shows for probably, oh, I'm thinking less than six months. Uh, Because at the same time that I was hired, 
they were starting a fledgling Spanish program in Foque La Familia. And they didn't even know I spoke Spanish when they hired me. And so um, I was there, I was editing the English broadcast, and uh, Gary Booker, who started the Spanish broadcast, and I got to know each other, like in the hall, and he found out that I spoke Spanish and that I was an editor. He needed an editor, so I quickly transferred over to the Spanish side. And, um, and from there, yeah, I was a manager of the Spanish broadcasting uh, department for many years, um, and uh, then eventually director of Hispanic ministry for Focus on the Family. Wow, that's, that's amazing. So I guess you were stationed there in Colorado Springs? at the Yes. Headquarters. Uh, most of the time, we did have one year that we were in Costa Rica, uh, where I went to uh, help them s establish a, a radio uh, communications department. So we uh, built out a studio, hired people, and then did all the training. And uh, that was a great experience, great experience for my family to finally be out of the U.S. and in a culture that was different than their own and yeah. to experience some of what I grew up with. That was important for me, for my wife to experience that. Well, you know, one thing, I, I, had, I had the privilege of traveling with the ministry for many years as a photographer. We went all over Central and South America. And, mm -hmm. and uh, my kids had never gone on, quote, a mission trip. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, they need to experience a different culture and I started thinking to be, I actually was thinking I was going to just take them on a mission trip somewhere. And then, then the Lord kind of revamped the, my desire to live on a mission trip. Mm. So it went from being on a mission trip to being uh, the mission trip, being a part of our lives. Yeah. And that often happens. <laughs> and I tell you, it's, it's been the most wonderful experience of my life and our family's life. I mean, the changes all for the better have been just phenomenal. Um, leaving the U.S. and being a part of a different culture. Uh, you don't know a lot of the bad traits that you incorporate into your life just because this is the way the culture is or the way sure. your, your lifestyle that you see everybody, even in church. But, you know, when you leave, then you start realizing maybe that's, you know, you start reading the Bible a little bit differently and realize that maybe your lifestyle, culture, things that you allow yourself to be a part of or see or whatever just because it's a part of the society mm -hmm. you realize this is not, this is not right and right. so it's been a great cleansing time for all of our lives it's like coming out of a place that was filled with smoke but didn't know it smelled like smoke because that's the way you know you just got used to the smell and when you leave you smell your clothes and you think oh my goodness i stink yeah, where have i been <laughs> where have i been <laughs> i thought i was playing going bowling you know yeah <laughs> and found out you know uh, there was smoke, you know, that was in the distance you didn't realize was yeah. there. And, and now it's just kind of a decontamination. Um, one of the things I really think that a lot of things that have been decontaminated in, in my life is pride. and Because mm -hmm. it's just, you don't realize what's inside of you until you leave or until the temperature in your life, the refining fire of God begins to turn up on your life. And then just junk starts coming up to the surface that you yep. didn't realize you had. And that's one of the best things of leaving is that you get to see maybe some things that need to be cleaned up in your life. Well, and that's, that's a, a really good point, um, the pride issue, because one of the aspects of the Latin culture that those who live among Latinos, whether it be in the United States or overseas, um, know that the culture really is a very humble culture. And so the pride that we carry as gringos, um, affectionately gringos, <laughs> I've been called that not so affectionately <laughs> in the past. But, um, yeah, the, the, the pride that we carry as a culture is um, uh, something to be reckoned with and, and is often um, uh, very um, ugly when it rears its head in another culture. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, I use that term because, you know, a lot of people might have heard the ugly American um, uh, it's a term that, that came up uh, like in the 1950s, and uh, it really describes an American that believes that they know it all, they have all the answers, everybody should listen to them, and other cultures need to learn from the superior culture of the United States uh, because we do things right and other people don't. Um, and, and, you know, that's obviously a very big generalization. Um, not all Americans are like that, thank God. But we all have a little bit of that in us. And so when we go overseas, um, we tend to take that pride with us, thinking 
you know, American exceptionalism. You know, and, and yes, there's a lot of exceptional things about the United States, about the history of our country, uh, where we came from and, and, and what uh, we've been able to do in the U.S. But there's also exceptional things about other cultures. And I think we all need to learn that. And once you, once you start living among a different people, you begin understanding, you know, like uh, the attribute of humility and how important it is to be humble, to be able to serve others, um, and there's so many that I could, in fact, you know, you know this because you, you heard one of my talks, but I actually do a talk on cultural differences between uh, North Americans and Latin Americans and how to adjust between those two and the positives and negatives about both because both have very positive issues and very negative issues. And that is one of the things that I think is key. You just mentioned being a servant and the people here, they're servants. I mean, they're, they're just... They serve and they enjoy that they have a, mm -hmm. they have a, I don't know, there's like a joy that, that they have inside of them. And you look around these people and you think, well, how can they be so happy with nothing? They yeah. did a poll not too long ago, Gall Gallup did, looking for the happiest people on the planet. And Panama came in first. Yep. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I think it's, it's wonderful to live amongst people who are happy with very little. Yeah. Because it's not, it's not a good place to be if you're living amongst unhappy people with a lot because they're like they can become like spoiled children if they ever have anything taken away from well, them. Well, and frankly, the having a lot often is what makes you unhappy yeah. because having a lot produces stress in your life. You know, you want to guard what you have. You want to protect it. You don't want somebody to rip you off. You know, all these things produce stress in your life. Uh, you want to know who to give it to and who not to give it to and who, uh, who friends, to go who in business with and exactly <laughs> i mean all those things you know if you have very little yeah. those aren't worries those aren't concerns the daily life becomes more important and you know if people your friends aren't there for what you got <laughs> you <Yeah>. know <laughs> you know i, I wanted you to kind of share a little bit about how the transition you know you came here was it may or january when august was it? Was well it? i i came when earlier came. yes yes i moved here in august but yes we came in March and then in May. Okay. Yeah. And uh, you came with John Phillips. Tell uh, John's been on the program yeah. a few times, and I just would love to kind of hear how that that connection took place. Because yeah. I know God has a way of just <laughs> divinely coordinating. It's things. a it's a great story, and you know it. You know, until things like this happen to you, you sometimes wonder when people tell you a story. You know, are they embellishing? Did they really happen the way they say it did? But everything I'm telling you really happened the way it did. Um, we actually came to Boquete um, 10 years ago when we were living in Costa Rica. Uh, we had to leave every three months to renew our visas. And somebody told us, you need to go to this beautiful town up in the mountains of Panama. So we came here. Um, this was before infrastructure was even here. It was just a little dinky town, but beautiful. And we fell in love with it. We had no earthly clue back then that we would actually be living here now. So fast forward um, 10 years later, uh, it was late last year, and we just felt like God was more and more calling both of us, Denise and I, uh, to move overseas again. And we had always loved this area. We actually looked for land in Costa Rica for a while. Um, land is very expensive there, by the way. Um, so um, the Lord had closed those doors, but we had always wanted to live in Central America, and he really started laying that on our hearts very, very much so um, at the, near the end of last year for a multitude of reasons, uh, some of what was going on in the United States and still is, uh, but also just wanting to get into the Latin culture again. Um, you know, I have a real heart for that. So um, we began researching that. And uh, at the same time, my son was asked to do a, a training at a YWAM facility in San Jose, Costa Rica, um, over spring break. Um, he's studying engineering and renewable energy at John Brown University, and they asked him to do a training in solar energy at YWAM. Well, um, he had never traveled overseas alone, and so he asked Denise and I to go with him. We're like, well, of course, yeah, we got tons of friends down there. I've got clients down there. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll go. So uh, we came to Costa Rica, and uh, while he was doing the training, we thought, you know, why don't we hop on a bus and go to Boquete and just, just see it again, you know, see how it's changed or whatever. And let's pray, you know, what, what God you might have for us there. 
And so we did, and we came with great expectation. We, we came thinking, you know, God's going to show up in a powerful way, and, you know, there's going to be uh, bursts of lightning and thunder, and the heavens are going to open, and angels are going to sing, and we're going to know this is the place. Well, we spent about three days here, and none of that happened. And uh, we went back to Costa Rica and then back to the U.S., and we were rather discouraged. Um, yeah, I was thinking, God, we laid this at your feet, and you didn't show up. What's going on? You know? And I, I, was, I was like, I guess maybe God doesn't want us to move. When was this again? When? This was March of oh, this year. This last, past oh, well, year. Past year, 2015. Okay. Uh-huh. So um, a week after we returned to the States, I get a message from John Phillips. This is when John comes in. I had not heard from John at all for eight years. Uh, we became very good friends about 10, 12 years ago, but we had lost touch, you know. They, they lived in a different state than us, and, and so it um, uh, lost touch, and I hadn't heard anything from him in eight years. I suddenly get a Facebook message from him that, that simply says, these were the words, Daryl, when can we talk about Panama? <laughs> and you can imagine my surprise. I'm like, okay, I haven't heard from this guy in eight years. We just got back from Panama, and he sends me this message. So I, I uh, sent him another message, and I said, uh, here's my cell phone. Give me a call. You know, let's talk. So the next night, he said he was working at his desk, and the Holy Spirit just came on him and said, John, stop what you're doing. Pick up the phone and call Daryl right now. So we did. Um, he obeyed the Holy Spirit's voice. He got Debbie on the line. I got Denise on the line. We chatted for a few minutes, you know, catching up. How are the kids? All that kind of stuff. And then I said, and not wanting to let on anything, I said, so John, what's this about Panama? <laughs> and, uh, and he said, well, um, we have been praying for several months about who we should tell some news to. Uh, we have some news and, and we've been wanting to be you know, to listen to, the, to God's voice, to see who we should tell this news to. And God kept bringing you and Denise to our minds over and over again. We don't know why, but we're, I guess we're supposed to tell you this. This summer, we're moving to Boquete, Panama. <laughs> and, I, you know, it was, it was one of these moments where I took the phone away from my face. Denise and I looked at each other, and we started both tearing up. It was just like God had showed up in such a powerful way that nobody could possibly explain eight years of never having heard from this guy. And he mentions the very city we were contemplating going to. And, uh, you know, John's on the other end going, hello, hello. <laughs> and I get on and I say, John, do you have any idea where we were one week ago? He's like, no. I said, we were just in Boquete, Panama. And he's like, what? <laughs> and so it was, really, it was really kind of a confirmation for both of us, both sides, um, and we felt like that was God saying, you know, this is what I've called you to. You thought I was going to do it while you were there, but just like Lazarus, I showed up three days late. <laughs> of course, in our case, about a week late. And, uh, you know, Jesus did that on purpose with Lazarus. He let the guy die on purpose that's right. because he had a greater plan. That's right. And that's what we felt God had done with us. Wow. And that's here cool. we are. We're here and the Phillips are here. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that crazy? <laughs> yeah. This is the way... Uh, you know, I've never seen so many divinely coordinated events in people's lives. Um, you know, it's like it just he just shows up um, for some reason. Something very special is happening in this place, and and uh, we're just excited just to be a part yeah. of what he's doing. And and uh, you know, I saw this thing like a um, I had when I first got here. I had a vision of a an orchestra leader. Um, you know, had a white glove in his hand and little baton, you know, orchestra baton was tapping the podium. And when I saw this tap, tap, a hand tapping on the podium, I heard the words, attention, everyone, take your positions. Mm -hmm. We're about ready to make some beautiful music together. And what I, wow. I believe what he's saying to me, is, and it, it showed me this, is that the seats that are in his orchestra are for the obedient, that have, that can do what they've been called to do and do it well. And they're not focused on anybody else that's in the orchestra pointing out their faults. They're just playing their part. And, and if everybody with their eyes on the orchestra leader plays their part, together we make a beautiful harmony together because we're all 
being coordinated by the leader right of the orchestra who is the lord and and i'm just as a word of encouragement for people you know this is all about our own obe- obedience to the lord in everybody's mm-hmm. life whether it's daryl going to Boquete or wherever somebody's supposed to go or whatever they're supposed to do your part that you play everybody's part that they play is critical to what God wants to do with everybody together. Mm-hmm. And if everybody does their little part, we all don't have to do everything. We just have to do our part well and keep our eyes on the orchestra leader and not focus on everybody else's fault and make excuses because of the violin player <laughs> messed up. I get I, I have my excuse <laughs> you yeah. know, for messing up, but we just have to really do our job, what God's called each one of us to do well. Right. Yeah, and the thing I tell people is there's two steps. There's the first step of hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, of being attuned and attentive so that you can hear that still small voice because it won't be the the loud thunder and the earthquake and so forth. It'll be a still small voice. So you have to be listening. And then the second step is once you listen, what are you going to do about it? And that's the hard part because God can tell us things that we don't necessarily want to do. That's right. (laughs) And it usually is stuff that we don't want to do. Our flesh, you know, screaming, I mean, you know, I think you're right on the money right there with the fact that you have to first hear. You know, it's not just hears only, but it's doers of the word. He's called us all to do what he's called us to do. Right. But he's, you know, the, the blessing is that he's, he's an, he will enable us to do what he's called us to do. If, he's tell, if he gives us a job, he's not going to give us a job without enabling us to do the job. In fact, I've got a, 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 my, the saying that I've got on my Skype account says, God does not call those who are equipped. He equips those he calls. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and it's true. You know, I mean, if you look at throughout history, wh- whether it was Abraham, when God called him to a country he had never seen, and he dropped everything and just blindly walked through the desert, I mean, that's, that's significant faith. Um, whether it's Corey Ten Boom, who, you know, people were... Uh, she was hiding Jews in her in her home, and uh, we can easily say, "Man, I don't know if I could do that. How could I possibly do that at the risk of my life and my family's life?" But you know, God gives the grace for the moment. That's right. He doesn't give grace in advance. He doesn't give you a storehouse of of grace. He gives grace as you walk with Him. That's right. And so, um, you know, if put in that situation, if we're truly following Christ. Uh, we will have the grace to do what he's asked us to do. You know, living here is not always a piece of cake. You know, there, there are moments that you need a lot of grace. People yes. do things differently here. Yes, you know? yes they do. And, 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 and I, I've spoken to so many North Americans who have come here and who are, um, you know, taken aback by the fact that, you know, things take so long or, you know, the processes aren't efficient or there's, you know, uh, you have to go to five different people to get done what you could get, what you could go to one person to get done in the States. That's right. And I just have to tell them, yes, things are different. God is honing you. God is refining you. And God is teaching you that people, although they're different, he loves them just as much as he loves any of us. And he died for them. And you also should give your life for them. That's right. You know, this is uh, something that's really important for people to understand is that you know, given it shall be given unto you, good measure pressed down, shaken together. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we all need grace every day. And I think that's the key to our own grace is giving others grace and, and not being too critical in situations because they aren't exactly the way we want them to happen. Right. We have to be very forgiving, very loving. And that's one of the keys, I think, that people need to understand if they are going to make an adjustment and move to another culture, another land, First of all, they have to know that they heard God tell them to go. Mm-hmm. And then they have to hang on to that word with everything they've got, just like the disciples when they were told to go to the other side of the lake in John chapter 6. The storm came. Yep. Contrary winds means they were blowing against them. And they're probably thinking, why did you have us go out here? Why didn't you <laughs> tell us in the morning when the wind would die down? But you know what it is is that you know our faith is strengthened. Our muscles are strengthened going through the storm. In the, de- in the direction God's called us to go. You know, it's much easier to turn the sail and head back to shore, but that doesn't strengthen anything. And I think a part of this is really trusting God. You know, is knowing I, I know I heard from the Lord. I, I had confirmations. 
many people that come here, they know they heard from God, they had confirmations, and yet the storm was too great for them, and they turn the sail and go back where, they, where it's easier to live. So it's not an easy thing, but I, one of the things that I, I encourage people with is, look, you have to be, know that you heard, but another thing, you have to be thankful. You have to be grateful that, that you are where you are. Some people feel like, well, I was taken advantage by this person or this or this happened, and, and then they get bitter and they get complaining. And it's like the children of the wilderness. You know, they start thinking about leeks and garlic, and they just mm -hmm. murmur and complaining. And I just say, you know what? You better be careful because you're going to buy yourself a round-trip ticket, you know, um, you need to just find a place of thankfulness. Yeah, so as this is a, the, the old Keith Green song. So you want to go back to Egypt <laughs> where it's warm and secure? <laughs> What's left there? I don't think there was much left in Egypt. Yeah, There wasn't much. I think leeks and garlic were nothing but a memory, and that's what they wanted to go back to. And, mm -hmm. you know, the thing is you have to pursue the will of God, and it, it's not an easy thing. It's not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom, but he that do the will of God. And I don't think anybody's going to do the will of God unless they pursue the will of God. It has to be inside your heart. And uh, I wrote an article a while back. It's called The Boomerang Gang. And one thing that, you know, Jesus said, you must forsake all to follow me. And, and that means once you forsake all, there's no reason to turn around. You just keep your eyes focused ahead. Where, are you, where am I going, Lord? Yep. And you just keep trotting forward. You don't go backwards because you've already left everything. There's nothing. And the thing is, too, is if you forsake all, you know, the Lord gave me a word one day is that let go, let go. I said the, the, the world has a grip on many. He said you must let go of it to let, for it to let go of you. Mm -hmm. The problem is that the world has a grip on our heart because we have a grip on the world. We have to let go of the things of the world in order yep. for the world to let go of our heart. Oh, that's very true. And, and you know, the, the, the people that do um, leave the U.S. can attest to the fact that uh, you have to let go of a lot of things that you got comfortable with in the U.S. Right. Um, you know, I, I, I tell people that make sure you are coming for the right reasons. You know, um, don't come because obedience. don't come because um, for some reason you feel uh, like you've got to escape, like you like you've been hurt by somebody um, in the states, like uh, somebody's laid a guilt trip on you and said you you need to be serving the Lord overseas. Um, you know, there's lots of wrong reasons. Um, the, the right reason is you've heard a calling That's and right. you're moving in that calling. That's right. And you're moving in obedience to what God's called you to do. And that's yep. what I encourage and suggest for everyone to do is hear from God and then do what he says. Yep. Daryl, thanks for joining us today and appreciate you being with us. Sure thing. It's my pleasure. It's Thank great. you for joining us on Strength for the Journey. Again, our website is strength with the number four, thejourney.com. And we'll see you next time. Yeah.